Good morning. <laughs> Is that, uh, maybe I just am fine without adjusting. What do you think? Because you have it all set for you, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 You can all hear, can't you? No? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No? Oh, perfect. Oh, good. Good. Well, welcome again to the third in our series in our Brown Bag March <clears throat> programs. You're even better than church. Uh, th thank you for lining up in a good space to have our presentation. I'm thinking that perhaps as you walked across campus, and thank you for finding this substitute location for today, that maybe um, in, in your walk across or where you parked, uh, you noticed again the point, the Harlan Lincoln House, the yellow house on the corner that is so meaningful to the legacy of Iowa Wesleyan University and the family that has such a strong connection, a Midwestern family, just a normal family that had such an impact on not only our region, but the whole United States. And it came from this place, amazing. And today we're going to have more opportunities to know about some of that connection. So I hope that uh, when you walked across or when you go back to your car, you just um, take a look at that house and see that as a visual reminder of what we have here in heritage. So, Anyway, I think with um, the, the presentation this morning by our new director, Spencer Barton, it's perhaps a good time to highlight some of the other structure uh, of the management of the Friends of the Harlan Lincoln House. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce myself as the chairman of the group, but the rest of the committee uh, wave when I call your name. Lee Bradley, Paul Jewell, Pat White, Tricia File, um, Meg Rickman, went back, and thank you, and uh, Jeff Meyer uh, serves as uh, Spencer's Connection Liaison uh, to the Wesleyan Archives. We appreciate all of your volunteer time, but as important as anything, certainly your perspective and your appreciation, your loyalty to what this house means. Thank you. Now, with all those uh, kind of uh, strong adjectives, may I put in the pitch for volunteers. You know, we're always looking for docents and those who can give tours and who can explain this heritage to guests who come. Uh, if this uh, trips your trigger, if you're interested at all, uh, please visit with, Bart, or with Spencer because certainly um, docents, uh, we, we have to have folks who are, who are willing and able to tell the story. We'd appreciate your support in that. Uh, next Tuesday, guess what? Change in location again. We'll be back to our usual spot in the social hall. So keep that in mind. We'll remind you again at the end of this program. But we will return to the social hall for the final presentation um, next Tuesday. Isn't March going quickly? Golly. Um, Anyhow, I will uh, remind you once more, of course, uh, to turn off your phones. You've done that, I'm sure, already. Because we are eager and awaiting the presentation by Spencer Barton, the director of the Harlan Lincoln House. Spencer is a graduate from uh, Wartburg College in Waverly, and uh, his uh, majors there were history and chemistry. So that wonderful duo has advantages uh, for archival preservation and understanding as would be quite obvious. He also attended Western Illinois University's Moline campus uh, for their museum studies graduate program. So he has jumped in with both feet, understanding the legacy and heritage we have here. And we are eager to hear uh, his presentation today about some of those artifacts. Spencer, thank you. If I'm talking like this, can everyone hear me pretty well? Or would you 
you like me to use the microphone still? You're good. Thank you. Thank you. You think I better use it? Okay. Okay. That's fine. I don't like staying put. I'm a mover. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for showing up today. Um, so today is a is I have two goals in mind. The first is to introduce myself a bit. Many of you I've met already, but some of you I'm sure you still have yet to see me or talk with me. Uh, so meet me, the person, but also meet my methodology and, and how I really like to approach history um, as I've been sculpted through my undergrad and my graduate years. Um, so let's go. So who am I? Uh, so I'm the director of the Harlan Lincoln House, have been since October. Uh, as a director, I am a single employee to the house, uh, though I have many team members to help me from the university. Uh, but I am the curator, I am the archivist, I am a public face for the house, I'm the historian, the tour guide, the interpreter, uh, I do social media, I'm the f I help with fundraising, I help with volunteer management. I have many hats, um, all of which I need to be at least moderately competent in to be successful. Um, as Liz mentioned, I studied at Wartburg College and at Western Illinois University. There, I really got to expand how I wanted to approach history and how I wanted to practice history. Uh, and in that, I have brought myself into two schools of thought. One is called post-humanism, the other is new materialism. These are ideas that come out of the, away from the postmodern ideas of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, trying to harken back a bit to some of the themes of the modernist movement, of the turn of the 20th century, while still borrowing many of the benefits the postmodernist movement brought us. Um, I'll explain what that really means soon, but in addition to my methodology, we're then going to talk about how I use that in the artifacts that I take care of at the Harlan Lincoln House day to day, and how I show them. Uh, we'll have an algebra lesson, we're gonna talk about some lovely urns, and we're also gonna talk about a banister. So I need to start off with what is an object biography? Uh, this is something that comes out of the 1990s into the 2000s, mostly in archeology span and art study, uh, but it's expanded out to sociology and history as well. The big benefit of it is it takes away the human aspects of artifacts and of objects and tries to understand them on their own terms. What do I mean by that? The goal of them is to think about objects as their own bodies, as that they have their own lives, their own existence, and that it's not what necessarily we put into the objects or how we use those objects, but that the objects themselves can act on us and act on other objects as well in the day-to-day. -day. Um, there are a couple of terms I need to define. One of the big ones is object. In this case, in the new materialism and in post-humanism, uh, it's a very broad term to call something an object. Specifically for this presentation, though, I'm just going to have physical material things that you and I can touch, look at, taste, things that we can sense ourselves today. Uh, in the field, you could also expand this to energy, you can expand it to atoms, it, it can really be quite diverse, but today, for its purposes, it's just going to be physical things that we can see, touch, taste, and specifically things that are in the collection at the Harlan House. Um, also, there are two terms I wanted to find, just because I might say them. One is actant. That is essentially just an object that is able to act. It has autonomy, it is able to act on other things, it has a life of its own, and related to that is the idea of an assemblage, which are many actants working together in a network. Think about it like the human body, where you have a heart and lungs and bones and blood vessels. All of these things work together and make up what is the human body, but they also have their distinct lives that they are producing. They have their own roles that they're playing and interacting with other objects in the body. Uh, they can work together, so the blood vessels and the heart, for instance, working together, but also they can work against each other, such as when you eat some rotten food and your stomach gets upset from that, where there are these two forces that are working against each other in that point. Maybe. There we go. 
So we're going to start things off with a book. And not just any book, but one of the books owned by Abraham Lincoln II, went by Jack. Uh, he was the middle grandchild who would have visited the Harlan Lincoln house uh, for summer vacations with his parents and time with grandma and grandpa. This book is an algebra book. It was one that he used in about his high school level studies in Chicago. Uh, and this book, like any other book, does have its own story that dates back to before it becomes a physical book itself. We can trace it back to the publisher printer. Uh, in this case, Jen and Heath from Boston are the ones that published this book. They also printed the book. Um, and then you can follow the paper trail to understand that they, where they got the paper from. It was from the Smith Paper Company in a mill in uh, downstate Massachusetts, just on the border of Connecticut. And even further, you can follow where did they got their lumber from, which is actually in a town in Connecticut which had just had a new dam built and that allow them to have new lumber mills put in place there that would have timber taken down there in Connecticut, shipped to this lumber mill, made into paper, shipped to the paper maker, or to the bookmaker, and then assembled into the book that we have today. Uh, so all of these things are these actants. So the dam, the trees, these mills, they are actants in the assemblage that lead into this book that we have today. There's this long past it has to it. Uh, the book itself is authored by G.A. Wentworth. He's not so well known today. However, he was quite the scholar of the time. This is the 1880s, a uh, little bit in the 1870s as well. Uh, he published actually about 60 different academic books, mostly textbooks like the one that Jack used, um, all mostly on mathematics. A couple were in biology and one on astronomy. Uh, we don't know a lot of else about Wentworth. Uh, we don't know when he was born or when he died. All we know is that he has this long past of publishing, specifically with Jen and Heath Company, and really no one else. He kind of falls off the face of the earth after uh, his last book is published in 1902. Um, going to the book directly, there are a couple of interesting things. The first thing would be, how do we know that this was Jack Lincoln's algebra book? Um, and this is something that I'll have open at the end of the lecture. You can come up and look at. But in the front cover, it actually says Abraham Lincoln in these big, bold colors. It has his hour that he took this class in. It's 10:20 uh, to 11 that he took this algebra class in at the school in Chicago. And actually, that's what the illustration on page six is. That is the illustration of the school building that is still there. Uh, it's now the Latin School in, of Chicago, but originally it was the preparatory university school when Jack went there. Um, and I guess that is something I forgot to mention. So these illustrations are ones that I did myself. Um, I don't like to use pictures for a couple of reasons. The first thing is by drawing a picture, I'm interacting with the artifact itself and having a different relationship with it than if I'm just taking a static picture. I have to really look at the details of the artifact itself and appreciate the nuances in its structure and in its color and in its design. Um, additionally, though, this means you're going to have to come to the house if you want to get a good look at them. So the book itself, as I'd mentioned, has its own life. So while it has this connection to Jack, and that's really important that we have these books, we actually have about a dozen books that Jack used while he was in school. Um, it's important to think about what the book did. What was its job? What, what did it do in its life? And that's usually what the subheading of this is, is the practical operator. Operator is, is a mathematic term. Uh, it refers to a function that does something to a number. So you put an input in, the operator works on it, and it brings something else out. It's non-reversible. It's a one-way system. This book is itself an operator in ways. So it, it teaches mathematics, and that is its operation, is that it distills knowledge of mathematics from the brain of Wentworth and his publishers to the students that read it later, that practice it, that use all of the pages and the exercises to understand mathematics better. Um, it, it really 
is this messenger, if you will, a record of what Wentworth is saying given to students that will use it in education. Additionally, though, this book has its own role now at the house. It tells the story of Jack. It tells us how far he got. For instance, he only got up to about there in the book, and with that, it meant that he never learned about logarithms from this book. He didn't learn about exponential functions from this book. He may have in other books, but definitely not in this one. He just stops using it. Uh, and we can tell all the exercises he did because they're all checkmarked, probably by the headmaster of the time. Uh, every time that he had to do a problem, probably either written down on a piece of paper or on a chalkboard. Um, also of note is on page 176, exercise number 48 is crossed out in big red letters. It's actually scribbled out even more, and it says, do not do, according to the headmaster. Um, I don't really know why that is. Uh, it's not a hard problem. It's a problem that has an answer. Uh, the best I can wager is that the problem is about using bank funds. So perhaps the headmaster just didn't want children to be working too much with bank finances yet. Uh, it's hard to really say. But all the same, we have all these artifacts of Jack's handwriting in this book. We're, I'm able and other people are able to actually look at what Jack did and how he used this item and now it lives in the house and continues to tell his story and how he used it. Uh, one last thing I'll point out about the book is in the very back, he had some fun with some stamps. Uh, there's this long train on it and then a couple of little houses. I don't know what the house is, but there are these little stamps of houses. And lastly, there's another, his name again, his signature, which he copied after his grandfather. We now move on to these two big utensil urns. These I'm very biased to. They are probably my favorite pieces in the whole museum. Uh, when I interviewed for this job back in the summer, they were the first things I saw. I couldn't take my eyes off them. I had to ask about them and find out more about them. Uh, if you've followed publications from the house, you know that I've written about them about four or five times because I just love them that much. I think they're so delightfully odd and practical at the same time. Uh, so the urns themselves, have a bit of a history in that they were very popular in the United Kingdom during the reign of the King Georges. So George I to three, George III being the king during the American Revolution. So this is throughout the 1700s, over a century before these are made. Um, but there's a resurgence in the late Victorian era that brings this style back, but in a distinctly American way, a very practical way, because we don't really see them in the United Kingdom again ever. These specific pieces are manufactured from the Berkey and Gay Furniture Company in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, they are a very prestigious furniture company. A lot of their pieces sell for big bucks. Um, these specific urns are made out of mahogany wood. And just like the book, I can trace back where they got the lumber from. In this case, this is the late 1880s into the 1890s. Uh, so the lumber is still able to come from the Caribbean and specifically from Mexico as well is where these pieces came from. At the end of the 19th century, actually, the mahogany plantations pretty much run out of trees. They were just over milled and too many trees were felled to maintain more product. Fortunately for uh, manufacturers and for consumers, there was mahogany trees found in Africa, but they are a very different kind of tree. These are distinctly Mexican or Honduran mahogany based on their grain patterns and their structure. Um, and it, I, I just think it's so important uh, to recognize that we can trace that story of its origin, that there really is a birth of these two objects, that they have a before they were, if, it, if you will, a time when they weren't and a time that they are now, a time when they're used and how they're used throughout that life. Notably, you'll see that one is open, one is closed. This one is actually quite terribly broken. 
There's a very large crack in the back here. This ring actually has fully separated from the top. It's in rather bad shape. Both of them are very faded. They had a lot more striking uh, bronze, almost gold paint on them. It's really now more of a dark brown. It almost fades in entirely to the body. But notably, that one does still operate properly. Uh, it's just friction held into place with a uh, square stock in the middle. It had been closed for an undisclosed amount of time. When I picked it up to number it in our catalog system, I noticed it was rattling. Um, so I had to know what was inside of it. Uh, so I picked it up, I took it apart, because the middle part actually does come out, put pressure in just the right spot, hoping I wasn't going to break anything. Thankfully, I didn't. And sure enough, there are forks and spoons that had been in there for who knows how long. Uh, they hadn't been cataloged anywhere, they hadn't been numbered, and they'd just been living inside of this urn like they would have when it was being used. The special thing about these urns, aside from their looks, was their practicality, and that's why I think that these are a distinctly American twist on these uh, style of furniture, is because the middle of these are actually hollow. It allows you to fill them with anti-tarnishing solvents, or salts as well, just to help preserve the silverware instead of having to worry about polishing them all the time. So they have this very practical purpose for existing, as well as looking, to me, quite dashing. Um, the building you see on page eight is actually the manufacturer, Berkey and Gay, that is the building that they had. On the top floors is manufacturing where they would make the furniture. On the ground floor is actually a showroom. People would go to Grand Rapids to this place and look on the floor and buy furniture right off the floor. Robert Todd Lincoln or Mary Harlan or someone related to them were the ones that went to Berkey and Gay's, got these that day, and brought them back to their home in Chicago. Uh, and eventually they make their way to here. They even, I've had, I've heard that they were at uh, Old Threshers at one point in time. They're taken outside and uh, among the dirt that were on these tables uh, for the house, I believe back in the 1980s. Um, their story, for me, is that they're this forgotten luxury. Every time I talk to somebody in a tour about these pieces, and I always do because as I said, I love them so much, they always say, I've never seen anything like that before. And I think that's it, that there's this essence of this forgotten luxury of these pieces. Now, of course, we don't really have silver like they used to, unless you have the wealth to do so. And even if you do, you really don't need these elaborate big urns to keep them from tarnishing. There are much better ways to do it today. But they give us this window into the past of how we thought about silverware that there's something that should be cherished and prized and that they can be displayed in these cases and kind of show off that you were well off or show off that you were proud of what you had and what you had done to get those things. They're this forgotten luxury in that they remind us to think for a moment about why we have what we have and how practical those objects can actually be. There's one final item I want to talk about, but I couldn't bring it here today. It's actually the main banister in the house. And originally I wasn't going to talk about the banister too much, but then I realized the more I looked into it that it became a lot more interesting. You see, items like banisters and rugs and doors we don't really catalog them or think about them as objects in the same way we do cups and mugs and paintings and bowls. Uh, we don't give them catalog numbers. We don't think about them having a past, really. They just are. They just exist. Um, and this banister has had quite the life. Even though its origins, we don't really know that much about. We can assume that it's original to the house, but we don't know when it would have been put in, like what specific year, for instance. When was the handrail manufactured? From where was it manufactured? We can assume it probably was made here. It's made out of uh, a, a white oak uh, and it has this very lovely maple inlay to contrast on the main banister board. Uh, but we can't say for certain. There just isn't record of it in that way. We don't 
track it the way we do the book or the urns or everything else in the house. This banisters had a life. It has been cut up at one point. When the upstairs was converted into an apartment of the Harlan Lincoln House, there was a false wall put in on the stairway, on the landing. And because of that, they had to chop it off. And that's actually what you see on, on page 10. There's this illustration where the banister just stops. That wall has been removed. We're actually in the process of refinishing it, making it have a new life again, make it look like it originally had. Uh, we know from that process, from this restoration of the banister, it actually was restored at least one time prior because the carpenter was able, when he struck everything away, saw that there were plenty of marks on the banister that were not his. So at least one other point in time, we don't know when, it would have had to have been refinished. Uh, prior to this most recent restoration process, it was covered in plaster dust and paint. It was really... It looked kind of dodgy at times. Also, from the use of, from our hand oil is getting on the banister, it had worn into a much lighter brown than its original color. It's really meant to be a color a lot close to those mahogany urns, actually, uh, but actually had this much lighter color more recently. Uh, in addition, light coming in from the window in the back and in the front door contributed to the bleaching of the wood. So now we have this opportunity to restore it and have a new life for the banister, continuing on its life that it's had thus far. Uh, also on page 10, you'll see all these uh, spindles. Those are spindles that have just been sitting in the storage room upstairs for some time. Uh, they would have been pieces that were part of the main banister when it was all together. Some of those spindles were actually given away, and one gentleman made them into an end table. Uh, he, he took the spindles, and then he had a couple pieces of wood put together, and he made them into end tables. So we can't even really fully have the banister like it used to be because of that. Uh, we do have pictures of those end tables, actually. They're, they look very nice. I just wish we had the spindles, personally. What's the story? What's the life of the banister, aside from how we interact with it? I chose utilitarian iconostasis, so let's, let's back up there and break that apart. Utilitarian in that it's very useful, it's practical, it's something that we use every day to the point that we don't even think about it. It's just a banister. We don't number it. We don't think about its past. It's just there. It exists to serve a function. Iconostasis. If you go to an Orthodox Christian church especially, you'll see these large wooden pieces of art that are up at the front. Uh, they separate the altar from the, the nave of the church or the sanctuary. Um, and they serve this role of, of beauty and subtlety uh, that they, they stay put and they separate us between the worldly place we are in and somewhere beyond. Uh, this might be a little far-fetched at this point to compare a banister to an iconostasis, uh, of which I didn't put simply because my Lutheran lenience kind of made me think uh, about icons. But anyway, um, I do think it's important to think about the function that the banister does for us. It separates us from the main floor to the top floor. It guides us up the stairs into a place that's less stable, someplace in a higher structure that we had to construct away from the ground against the pull of gravity, against the nature of us being grounded beings. In a way, it elevates us, or at least helps guide us to elevate us, and it has this role that it plays in our lives, again, without us even really having to consider it. It's just there. As I mentioned, I really couldn't bring it here it is still in the process of being restored. Uh, hopefully it will be put together within the next couple of weeks and we'll be able to reopen the top floor again of the Harlan Lincoln House. And I hope you'll all take the opportunity to look at it in its new glory, its, its new chapter of its life. So what? Why did I talk about all this for all this time? Uh, does it really matter? And truly, it, it may not, frankly. Uh, but for me, this is a way of expanding the knowledge we already have about the house. When we go to a museum, especially history museums, our goal is normally to connect with the human element of, the, of that museum, especially in a historic home. So we want to think about how the family lived. What was the family like? Uh, how are they different from me? How are they similar to me? And what can we learn from that relationship? 
and that's really important and good, and I don't want to detract from that. However, I would just posit the idea that if we expand our reach a little bit and think about the objects in and of themselves, how their lives impact those humans we're concerned about, in this case, the Harlan family and the Lincoln families and the grandchildren, and also, frankly, my life as the director who's now taking care of them, that it tells a more beautiful, broader story, a more full story. Uh, one way to liken this, and I hate to bring up math again because I'm sure some people it makes it a little itchy, but Think about it as you go to high school, you go through school, you go through high school, you learn algebra and algebra two and some geometry, and it's useful and you might use it later or you probably won't, you just have enough to like do your taxes and balance your bank account. What I am asking, what I am doing, is looking into trigonometry, calculus, uh, set theory, topography, looking at a more full picture of mathematics, as it were, in this case, of the history of this house, um, to just see the beauty that is within all of that history, uh, it, it capturing the imagination of ourselves in objects that we don't have anything in common with. I also want to be clear, when I talk about lives, I'm not trying to suggest that we have our human lives, and so do these objects. I think that's a little far-fetched. Um, what I'm more concerned with is understanding the objects on their own terms, understanding that the urn exists as an urn serving its purpose. It has a, a propensity to do its job or to not do its job. Uh, the book, it has the ability to maintain itself as a book, but as you can see, it, it's worn away. Its binding has fallen off. There's foxing on the pages. Uh, that's those little red spots on pages. Uh, the, the book is not in the same condition it used to be. It is losing from the forces of nature that it's decomposing. And of course, it's my job, hopefully, to preserve them and, and keep that process from going too far. But ultimately, the book has its own autonomy in all of this. It may not be equal, and by no means is this world an equal world when we talk about these different forces. There's always going to be something that wins out, otherwise nothing would change. There has to be some inequality somewhere. But in the case of the book, in the case of the urns that have faded, in the case of the banister that has had many iterations of new life now, they all have this continuity with us, where they have an overarching theme, where they have a goal. They exist with purpose, and that purpose may be simply to look nice. It may be to be in the background and help serve us, or it may be to act against other objects in and of itself to just preserve its own existence. By no means is this a required interpretation to understand, and I hope I didn't scare off any volunteers or potential volunteers that I'd want you to give tours like this. Um, I don't think that'd be very practical in most cases, but I do think it's a beneficial way to look at our world and to understand museums in general, that they really do have a distinct, different nature that doesn't just have to be human. It can also be of the objects themselves and the relationship we have with those objects. Uh, so thank you all for coming out today. Excellent. My golly, did I learn a lot, not only about the artifacts, but about process as well. And it also uh, generated some additional questions in, in my mind, too. Um, when we think about, though, um, artifacts, which bring us in lots of ways into the presence uh, of the owners, uh, sitting here in this chapel and perhaps walking by the statue uh, and then right across the street from the home. I'm, I'm sure that you might remember uh, from Westland history that James Harlan's funeral service was held right here. 
where we are sitting, maybe not quite in this configuration. The chapel was remodeled, I think, in 27. But um, in 1899, James Harlan's funeral service was in this place. So uh, we do reconnect with artifacts that uh, help us know more about understanding the persons that we are privileged to honor and uh, know more about. So. Uh, thank you very, very much. We'll look forward to coming uh, to the Harlan House, which is open, Har Harlan Lincoln House, which is open um, Monday through Friday, 1 to 4. And there you can see these artifacts for yourselves and hear more of the stories that um, you can uh, tell at the time. So uh, now, next week, we will be back in our usual spot, the social hall. 12 noon for our final brown bag presentation in this March series. We look forward to hearing from Michael Houston with all of his Civil War knowledge, also about artifacts and the people that made the difference. So please join us again. You can bring your lunch again next time if you'd like, uh, because we will be in our usual setup in in uh, the social hall. So have a good week until then, and we'll see you next Tuesday to learn more about the Civil War from Michael Houston. Thank you for coming. <laughs>